So why do we have a null hypothesis? The concept of a null hypothesis comes from frequentist statistics, which is one school of thought. There is another school of thought, however, which doesn't rely on a null hypothesis, and that is uh, Bayesian statistics. Instead of setting a null hypothesis and then trying to calculate a probability that we would have our observed data or something more extreme, uh, you know, given that null hypothesis, Bayesian statistics rely on trying to constantly refine an estimate of a relationship between two variables. And so Bayesian statistics start with prior probabilities, which is your best guess of what the situation is based on what we know so far. And then using new information from a data set that you collect or a study that you perform, the idea is to calculate a posterior probability, which takes into account the new information. So if you imagine that, you know, something is already known about uh, a question um, and you get new data, you don't start with assuming that there's no relationship between the two variables, because that's a bit of a silly assumption. Uh, since we know that there's something known about those two variables and how they relate to one another. In Bayesian statistics, you constantly refine that estimate. Um, and so what you produce at the end of your analysis is a more refined estimate of what you think that true relationship is in the population as opposed to calculating a p-value. So in Bayesian statistics, there are no p-values to calculate. Instead, you often arrive at um, an estimate of a relationship, and then you often have some measure of error around that estimate, um, which communicates to the reader what the you know, ranges of possibility in the population given what you know, with the idea being that as you collect more and more data, uh, or let's say you, you, know, you collect data on more and more people, that error interval uh, you know, gets narrower and narrower, but there's no p-value to calculate. So in this course, when I refer to statistical testing or hypothesis testing, I want to be very clear that I'm referring to frequentist statistics. Um, but this is not the only school of thought, and you may run into uh, publications, or you may yourself be uh, involved in doing Bayesian statistics where these principles don't apply, apply as clearly. The reason we formulate a hypothesis test is to try to you know, answer a question. And so when we run a statistical test, that test often generates a test statistic, which is different for each statistical test. And then that test statistic gets converted into a p-value using additional information like degrees of freedom. Um, and that p-value then is kind of broadly interpretable in a similar way across different types of tests. So when I say, you know, that we're going to run a statistical test to evaluate a relationship, I don't want you to worry about the test statistic, which may have no meaning for you. However, I do want you to look at the p-value and try to interpret what that p-value means for a given test. And just to remind you, the p-value is the probability of the observed finding or something more extreme under the null hypothesis. And in class, you know, we're going to ignore the test statistic and really just focus on the p-value. I recognize, you know, this is not giving you a complete picture, but it, it's a, uh, you know, a, a, a narrow way of looking at statistical testing, which lets us cover different types of tests. Um, but this is not all that you'll need to know if you plan to apply statistical tests, you know, uh, to writing a scientific manuscript, for example. So let's say we run a statistical test to evaluate the difference in cancer drug outcomes, and we find a p-value of 0 0.10. So notice I didn't really even say what the test was that I was running. Um, and obviously the p-value um, is only going to be interpretable if you know what the test is because the test might be a test of correlation. It might be a test of you know, differences in means. But regardless, we can still have some general interpretation of the p-value without even necessarily knowing the exact test. Uh, 
So how do we interpret a p-value of 0 0.10? The first thing you might want to jump to is to answer this question of, is that number statistically significant? Especially if you're familiar with uh, reading scientific papers. On the face of it, a probability of finding the observer something more extreme of being 10% under the null hypothesis basically means that you know, if the null hypothesis was true, our observed data has a probability of 10%. And that seems pretty unlikely to me. But in scientific research, there is this convention of a p-value threshold of less than 0 0.05, which is used to classify a finding as statistical a finding as statistically significant. This is completely arbitrary. And as you get larger and larger data sets, it becomes problematic because you can almost always find a statistically significant difference where that difference is very, very, very small and basically not really meaningful. So what if the p-value is 0 0.01? Do we accept that one cancer drug is better than the other? Kind of, but not exactly. So we're not able to accept our actual or, or alternative hypothesis because there may be other explanations for the findings such as confounding. So remember we originally set out an actual or alternative hypothesis is kind of what we wanted to do. We then reformulated what the null hypothesis would need to be. And if the p-value is 0 0.01, uh, we're able to reject our null hypothesis. And our, if our neural hypothesis is that the two cancer drugs are the same, we can say that that is highly unlikely given our data because there's only a 1% chance that the two cancer drugs uh, are the same based on our data. However, we can't therefore say that one cancer drug is better than the other because the difference we found might be due to things like confounding um, which we haven't accounted for. So recognize that based on a statistical test, you can never really actually accept your alternative hypothesis or accept your actual hypothesis. What you can do is reject the null hypothesis and say that there are multiple reasons why our null hypothesis appears to be you know, uh, rejected. One of those possibilities is that our actual hypothesis is true but there are multiple other possible explanations, which is why we can't just automatically say that one drug is better than the other drug. So we're comfortable rejecting the null hypothesis based on this p-value because we set our threshold at 5% or 0.05, but we can't accept our actual or our alternative hypothesis because other explanations may be possible. And remember that our null hypothesis here was that there's no difference in the two drugs. And so that's what we're, what we're rejecting here based on that p-value. Statistical tests do have sidedness to them. Um, and so you might have an alternative or actual hypothesis that on average, women in this country have a higher mean age than men. And this is a one-sided question because what if your data showed that men actually have a higher mean age than women. Wouldn't you want to know that uh, that was the case if that was true in the data? So if you run a one-sided statistical test, you won't be able to detect a difference if men are older than women. You'll kind of treat that situation as being analogous to the situation if men are the same age as women. And so typically we don't run one-sided statistical tests. So if your statistical test tells you there's an option to run it one-sided or two-sided, it's good to understand that the default is usually two-sided tests because what we're really saying is that uh, if our null hypothesis is that there's no difference, we want to know if we need to reject that um, hypothesis on either side whether women have a higher age than men or whether men have a higher age than women.